Right, so heaven and hell. <laughs> that should wake you up. Right? <laughs> um, how many of you have, uh, let me start with a strange question, how many of you have heard of Dan Brown's Inferno? Have you read the book? No. Who's watched the movie? Yeah? Okay. Who's a Dan Brown fan? Da Vinci Code, etc. Yeah, I am. Oh, good, good. good. Right. Okay, well, for that row there, I recommend it highly. Dan's right here, Da Vinci Code, etc. Well, I, I like it because he weaves fiction with history and religion and uh, a, a, lot, a lot else. So it's a mixture of fiction and a gripping narrative. And by the way, the, the movie and the book Inferno, which is about hell, of course, the title, is worth watching because, not to give too much away, but the endings of the movie and the book are completely different. So you can't spoil one by uh, seeing the other first. Now, one of the themes he talked in there is about Dante. How many of you have heard of Dante's uh, Inferno, or his uh, Paradiso, or the Divine Comedy, yeah? Sure, most of you have. So Dante was the greatest Italian poet. He's the Shakespeare of Italian. And in fact, his dialect of Italian became the dominant dialect, just because of his work, uh, right? And one of the interesting things about Dante's Inferno, not everybody agrees, of course, on the Divine Comedy, it's called, and it has three parts. Uh, Dante is taken by a Greek poet, is it Virgil or Homer? It's one of those. It's one of those, yeah. Uh, uh, on a vision through the inferno of hell, and then through purgatory, which is a place in between heaven and hell, where people are purged, and it's in purgatory, and then he's taken into heaven, basically paradise. So he's got three parts to it. Now there's a great Spanish orientalist of the 20th century, whose name was Athene Palacios, I've got that right. And he famously argued, wrote a whole book on this. He said that Dante was heavily influenced by the Quran and Islamic eschatology, so the Quran and these scriptures. He argued that over heaven and hell, the concepts are there, of course, in Christianity, especially to some extent in Judaism. The experts here will talk about that. He argued that you don't have the detailed imagery, the levels of the inferno, and the, also the levels of paradise. And so he actually argued that all, all these graphic descriptions uh, of both heaven and hell in Dante were influenced by Islam and by the Quran scriptures. He further argued that the story uh, of himself being taken was the spirit of, of a Greek poet, um, which would be the Virgil or Homer, I always forget which, through this journey. He said that was influenced by the story of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him's Mi'rab, or ascension to heaven where, according to the famous story in Mecca, the prophet is taken from Mecca to Jerusalem and then up through the seven heavens where he meets different prophets in each heaven. Different biblical prophets, has to be said. And then off through a journey through heaven and hell. And, uh, and then it, uh, sees God himself. Now the vision of God talks to God, comes back with the obligation of the 50 prayers per day which are reduced by Moses. Moses negotiated with the prophet saying it's too much. The Israelites couldn't do it. Your people won't be able to do it. And it eventually negotiated down to five uh, daily prayers, which a lot of Muslims find difficult. But uh, uh, th that's a great story, the prophet's ascension. So, so heaven and hell is, uh, is there very graphically in the Islamic scriptures. So for example, in hell, in the Quran mentions people will have their skins roasted off uh, and they'll be replaced by new skin to experience more punishment. It, it mentions the people of hell will be given boiling water and plus pus to drink. I mean, really horrible, terrifying description. On the other hand, heaven is a place of delight, of gardens of milk, pure milk, water, honey, and wine. Many Muslims don't know, forget. And not Muslims forget, the Quran promises wine to the disbelievers, wine which causes no anger or headache, and is a symbol of pure love. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, listen to what. Uh, um, Dan and Chris have to say. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, so it gives me great pleasure now to introduce um, Dan Kohn Um Dan is a rabbi of the Reformed Judaism um, and Professor of Emeritus of Judaism at the University of Wales. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, thank you very much. Well, I've got four minutes to tell you what Jews believe about heaven and hell. If you, if you ask Jews today, what is the view of heaven and hell in Judaism? Do, they, do you believe in life after death and heaven and hell? 
The answer is not clear. Um, and in explaining the concept of heaven and hell, I need to talk about its development over thousands of years. If you look back at ancient Israel, at what the Jews believed at their very beginning and for about a millennium, what is recorded in the Bible, you'll see that there isn't a doctrine of heaven and hell. Jews didn't really believe in ancient times that the dead would go in, after their life into a realm where they would be either rewarded or punished. In the Bible, there is the idea of Gehenna, which is sort of a nether world, a place where the dead go. But not much happens in this place, Gehenna. It's only later, in rabbinic times, that the concept of heaven and hell emerged in Judaism. And it emerged because of a problem. And it's a problem that's presented in, in scripture, if, if you know the Hebrew Bible. If you think of the book of Job, uh, are you aware of the book of Job? In the book of Job, Job is a righteous Jew. And he suffers. He has a terrible time. He loses his family. He loses his wealth. And he complains. He complains throughout the book. And he says to God, it's not fair. Why is this happening to me? There's no reason I should be, I, I should live such a miserable life. I've been a good, righteous Jew. Why are you doing this to me? The answer in the 38th chapter of the book of Job is basically, you don't understand my ways, God says to Job, you don't understand my ways, and you can't ask questions. But the rabbis did ask that question, and they came to the conclusion that we're not rewarded or punished in this life, we're rewarded and punished in the world to come. And so they developed a very complex theory about heaven and hell in, in response to the question, why do Jews why do human beings suffer even if they're righteous? And there are various stages in the belief of life after death. And the stages are as follows. So traditionally, Jews believe that in time, a personal Messiah will come, a human person, the Messiah. And that person will usher in uh, a period of redemption. What will happen is that when the Messiah comes, Peace will reign on earth. Jerusalem will be rebuilt. The dead, all dead Jews, will be resurrected. So there will be an enormous resurrection of all Jews. So there will be Jews who are alive at the time when the Messiah comes. Then all Jews who ever lived, this is millions and millions of Jews, will be resurrected. They will eventually return to Zion, to Jerusalem, to ancient Israel. It's going to be very crowded. And uh, and then, at the end of this period, there will be divine judgment, and the righteous will be rewarded, and the wicked punished. And the righteous will go to Gan Eden, that's heaven, and the, the wicked will go to Gehenna, and they will be punished. So that's basically the pattern, and that's what Jews believe for thousands of years, until really the modern period. <clears throat> In the modern period, those traditional ideas, eschatological ideas, about reward and punishment, have really disintegrated. Amongst the strictly orthodox, they still believe in life after death and heaven and hell. But amongst most Jews, uh, Reformed Jews, Conservative Jews, Reconstructionist Jews, there are different branches of non-orthodox Judaism, that idea has really disintegrated. And there are, of course, many secular Jews who don't have any belief at all. So if you ask the question, do Jews believe in life after death? Well. At the beginning, they did believe in it, but not in heaven and hell. Then they developed the ideas. 2,000 years, essentially, they believed in reward and punishment. And then that belief disintegrated. Beautifully timed. Thank you very much. Much to think about there. Um, before we go and discuss it, I'm going to introduce the wonderful Dr. Chris Hewer, um, who's been engaged in the study of Islam and Christian Muslim relations since 1986. He's former advisor on interfaith um, relations to the Bishop of Birmingham, um, and he's also. Very much. Uh, please do not judge their book on what I'm about to say. I haven't read it, I don't know anything about its contents, and I'm sure that the author of the Christian part thereof is much more erudite than me. 
Christians are possessed of a very clear understanding that God is beyond this world. So we're talking of a transcendent God. Therefore, everything that is with God is beyond this world, is beyond our ability to understand, beyond all our categories of knowledge. It's ineffable, unknowable. So what can you say about it? Well, very little, except that hopefully God exists, and hopefully the reward of heaven with God will exist also. But if you ask me to draw a picture of what it will be like, I haven't got a clue, because my categories of knowledge do not penetrate that far. So it is transcendent. There are lots of images which are given of heaven and hell, and these images are there to provoke a response amongst people. If you really thought that you were going to live for an immeasurable period of time in constant torment, fire and furnace, you might not do bad things. So the imagery is there to provoke a response amongst people, either positive or negative. However, one of the things that distinguishes the Christian position from my two colleagues is this doctrine of incarnation. And so what Christianity is saying is that in the sending of the word of God in human flesh upon the earth, God is revealing the true destiny of humankind. And the true destiny of humankind is to become fully human, and the model, of course, for being fully human is to be both fully human and fully divine. So as much as we can't talk about it, what we're talking about is some sort of union within that Godhead, within that community of the divine that Christians gloriously describe as Trinity. The final thing to say is then, what is hell? Now, Every creature that exists, exists in a relationship with the Creator. So God is both Creator as well as Sustainer. So the only way that you can escape a relationship with God is to cease to exist. And so many Christian scholars will speak of hell as being annihilation, ceasing to exist. So not a never-ending period of torment, but actually you can have what you most wanted in life, which is to be completely cut off from God. Another way of seeing this is that separation from God is the ultimate torment, because both if you accept the principle of Dean al Fitra, or if you are a Christian and follow Augustine, <coughs> and say, you made us for yourself, O Lord, our hearts are restless, are wanting, until they rest in you. Therefore, I never ascend, I never fully become the human being I was supposed to be, unless I'm in a relationship with God. Therefore, to be separated from God is the ultimate torment. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Now, I'm going to ask our <coughs> Actually, think about what one another has said there. Um, I don't know if you'd like to go first. Yeah, Simon, can you give us a Yeah, well, thank you, Dan and, and Chris. And what you've raised, I think, actually resonates within the Islamic tradition. So, these very graphic descriptions of, of heaven <coughs> and even purgatory. And, and by the way, Palacios argued that just as the Prophet Muhammad was accompanied by the company by Angel Gabriel throughout this journey, uh, hence he also had an accompaniment of the poet. So heaven and hell are, are places of delight and torment respectively. But this problem of eternal punishment, how can a most merciful God? I began with this Allah Rahman Rahim. Mercy is the ultimate uh, name of God, that's of all the 99 names. We have here a verse. My mercy encompasses all things. So the Muslim theologians, right from the beginning, were also concerned about this. How can a merciful God punish people forever? And, uh, and this was discussed from early Islam. It's lost now, often. A lot of Muslims are brought up with a very literal 
a fear of hell and uh, attraction to paradise. So Rabia and Adawiya, the famous uh, early Sufi and other early Sufis, argued that they called it the worship of traders. Imam Ghazali uses that term, so did Imam Nawawi. That to worship God, to do God and avoid evil for the sake of our health is fine, they said, but that's a worship of traders. Uh, you know, if you want something in return. They said the higher level is to worship God for the sake of God, not expecting heaven or avoiding hell. And they said that's the, uh, that's the worship of true love. And, and there are indirect references to that in the Quran. And ultimately the Quran says the ultimate pleasure of paradise is, is to be with God and to see God. And Sufis talk about union with God, etc. And that, that becomes quite controversial. But those ideas are there. And there were other creative responses uh, to this problem. So, so for example, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah ibn Qayyim and other of the uh, early scholars actually argued that hell would come to an end. Hell, hell was not eternal, whereas heaven was. And again, they use certain verses of the Quran which indirectly perhaps refer to that. So, so for example, la bikimatiya ahbaba. People stay in hell for ages. They argued ages is not infinite. It is final, it will come to an end. Anyway, it's a complex uh, discussion. But uh, Ibn Taymiyyah ibn Qayyim said, because there's also Hadith Qudsi which reflects the Quran, that of my mercy overcome by my anger. There is also a Hadith Qudsi which says, heaven is my mercy and hell is my anger. And so God's mercy overcome his anger, which is a fundamental Quranic principle, which is actually there in Surah Al Fatiha, if we uh, read it closely, would entail that heaven and hell are not symmetrical. Uh, so heaven overcomes. So they argue that heaven is eternal with God and, and hell is finite. And finally, let's end with this. Ibn Arabi, the greatest Sufi writer, uh, but very controversial and often regarded as heretical, but this is how creative he was. He said uh, the people of hell effect eventually become acclimatized. So if they're staying there forever, he basically said they become acclimatized so that hell becomes a, a source of pleasure for them. Uh, because that's all they know if you're there forever. And he bases on a Quranic idea that the word adab, which means punishment, the root word in Arabic is ab, which means sweetness. So he said the adab will become a good. The punishment will actually become sweet. So, you know, I'm not endorsing your, uh, I'm just discussing that. And even Arabic said this seven, eight centuries ago. Meaning that in the Islamic tradition, it's not a very simple picture of just heaven and hell. That there have been lots of creative responses to this difficult question of, of how a merciful God can uh, punish people forever. Wonderful, thank you. And Dan? Um, I think it would be fair to say that our three traditions traditionally believed in life after death and reward in heaven and punishment in hell. That's true of the three great monotheistic faiths. Despite the differences of interpretation that Osama has mentioned in Islam and different interpretations in Christianity and for that matter Judaism, different ideas about heaven and hell, despite that spectrum of belief, our three religions have agreed that there is a God who rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. But I think that, that presents two significant <coughs> problems for us today. The first is the idea that a merciful God, a loving God, who created the universe and cares for all humanity, would reward some because of what they did or because of what they believed, and punish others because of what they did or they didn't believe, and that that reward and punishment would be eternal. Think of the implications of eternal punishment, however it's conceived. Can we really reconcile the idea that, that human beings will be punished in the most terrible way forever? Now, I think many Jews and Christians, and I don't know about Muslims, find that difficult. So that's the first question. Can we really believe it, even though these, this is what our, our traditions have taught? And the second question is, what about the members of other faiths? Now, I, I didn't mention to you that according to traditional Jews, rabbinic Jews, you don't have to be Jewish to be saved. You don't have to be Jewish to enter into Ghana. As long as you keep a limited number of laws called the Noahide laws, there are only seven, uh, you can be considered righteous, whether you're a Shinto or, or a Buddhist or a 
Muslim and enter into heaven. You don't have to be Jewish. But certainly within Christianity, there's a very strong stream of belief that continues today that rules out heaven for all those who don't accept Jesus as their savior. Now, does that, does that make sense? If you're born like me as a Jew and you continue to be a Jew and you don't believe that Jesus is your savior, am I doomed forever? Does that seem logical? So I think these are really two significant questions that, that contemporary Muslims and Christians and Jews need to face. Can we believe in reward and punishment eternally? And what about the members of other faith traditions? Lots and lots to think about there. Um, we do three or four minutes. Chris, well, three. three minutes. Three. Three. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. I very much uh, resonate with what Osama was saying about Dante and this idea of imagination as a provocation to provide a certain amount of stimulus within, um, within human action. I remember doing uh, uh, something on introduction to the Shia Islamic components of the new GCSE syllabus for a group of people from a Jewish school. And we got into a very interesting discussion, which I, like uh, um, Dan, possibly would take up. Um, God, we argued, is just. But thank God, God is not fair. Because if God were fair, God would only be just, and there would be no room for mercy. So the mercy of God can overwhelm the justice of God. Something there to think about. Um, there are, of course, Christians who believe that anybody who doesn't accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior will be doomed. I have to tell you that, I mean, I am one of the most fortunate human beings on earth, that there are lots of Christians who are praying I will become a true Christian, and lots of Muslims who are praying I will become a true Muslim. <laughs> so we leave that question up to God. Um, Exactly the question that Dan raised is there in contemporary Christian theology as well. We speak of the universal salvation which is offered by God. And the question is posed this way. If God is all merciful and all loving, can we conceive of any human being who is strong enough to withstand the ultimate love and mercy of God? In other words, whether you like it or you don't, God will get you ultimately. And there were certainly early Christian theologians who talked about reincarnation as a way of giving God another chance to actually get us and to provoke that loving response. Finally, I'm interested in thoughts like how do we understand Fanar, the, the destruction, the absorption of the human being into the ultimate. And also, in the Shia tradition, we have a strong understanding of God being infinite and the human being infinitely progressing in love and worship and knowledge of God. And as mathematicians will tell you, infinity can never be reached. So there is always an eternity of progression to that which you can never reach.